So thanks for the introduction. I would also like uh, to thank. Uh, It was a long logistic discussion on where to put this microphone. <laughs> so I would like to thank the organizer for the opportunity to be here. And I would like to thank, and I say the names, Hossein Sadekpura, uh, Peter Schmelcher, and uh, Robin Sand. And I also would like to say that it is an honor to give a talk after Peter Lambropoulos. I will remember this day. <laughs> well, it, it's true. So uh, let me give a framework uh, of uh, what I'm going to talk about, just uh, to give a flavor of what is uh, the field where we are moving in. It is a pi little piece of studies on one component plasmas. One component plasmas are gases uh, made up of uh, singly charged particles. Say E is their charge, and now I'm already, here is the beamer, oh yeah. Will we manage? Yes, maybe. So here you see this is a charge E, and this parameter gamma is actually determining the thermodynamic properties. In the classical regime, you see that it is practically the parameter that contains the physical quantities and determines the, thermo the thermod thermodynamic property of the system. So what is this parameter? This parameter is actually the ratio between the interaction strength between two particles. E square is a charge square. A is the interparticle distance, is one over the uh, density to the one third, and A is so called the Wigner size ratio. And the second term that enters in, in the denominator, is the thermal energy, KT. So this tells you that when uh, the thermal energy exceeds the interaction potential, then you are going to have uh, very low correlations, and the system will behave like a liquid. On the, other on the other hand, if you decrease the temperature, or say you are able to increase the density or the charge, so you take highly charged particle, you can achieve a very large coupling parameter and reach the strongly correlated regime. So what you see here is a plot, <coughs> which actually comes from a review of modern physics of uh, Daniel Dubin and uh, uh, Thomas O'Neill. This is a phase diagram where you see temperature on one axis, axis and density on the other. And you see a series of lines uh, which give the different phase you can achieve. And in three dimensions, which is here the case for periodic boundary condition, assuming a homogeneous system, one has a transition, and this is what interests us, from a fluid to a crystal at gamma equal to 174. I will actually focus on this regime. So how does one uh, study this type of system uh, in an experiment. So one possible realization is actually is going to be is, uh, the only one that I'm going to discuss are singly charged ions, which are alkali earth atoms that have been ionized of one electron. And so they behave like alkali atom and they absorb and emit in the visible. So these atoms are uh, confined uh, in uh, region of space by means of electromagnetic fields. In this case, uh, one uses static electric and magnetic field, uh, and by means of electrodes, one manages to give rise to a potential which confines the particle in a region of space uh, with a force that brings them towards the center, which is an harmonic force or can be tailored to be also a non-harmonic force, like x to the 4. In this case, it is an harmonic force. This was a system made of, uh, I think, 10,000 of the order of 10,000 beryllium atoms. What you see here is uh, the structure that was observed after laser cooling the atoms. Actually, here there is a magnetic field that helps confining the atoms, so they actually the crystal rotates in time, so this is a stroboscopic image. And what you see here is where the atoms are. You see them by fluorescence, and by looking at the diffract diffraction, one sees that the peaks are according to the expectation of a body center cubic structure. So indeed, uh, one gets long range order in this system. And how does one achieve this temperature? I just said it uh, shortly. The method uh, to achieve temperature, which allow us to, achieve, to reach very large coupling parameter, is for the systems laser cooling. And the temperature one achi achieves is of the order of few microkelvin and can be even below that by means of uh, some sophisticated techniques. What you see here is a picture of a crystal that has been realized in the group of Michael Drevsen in Oros. I actually should say that uh, this is an experiment that was done in Nist, Boulder, in the group of John Bollinger and Dave Weiland. Now, 
I go back, I, I talk about Lisa Kurin, and I show you here a, the picture of this uh, um, crystal, I think is made up of magnesium atom, is actually two dimensional structure. Here it is there, just to give you a pictorial view of uh, a system, like the one I'm going to discuss. What you do is to shine lasers at frequency omega, and you actually use uh, uh, the scattering property of the atoms in order to enhance processes in which the photons, which is emitted as a frequency omega prime, which is larger in average than the frequency of the absorbed photon. The difference in frequency is mechanical energy which is transferred uh, from the ions to the reservoir, which is the electromagnetic field. So that in average one manages to uh, take away mechanical energy from the ions and then achieve this regime in which correlation are strong and one observe them long range order. So I just give, uh, before I start uh, uh, with uh, reviewing our work, uh, some of the applications of crystal of ions in atomic physics. This is actually the cover of Nature that appeared in 2003 of uh, two experiments. Actually, this is for the experiment of Innsbruck, but two experiments were reported back to back, <coughs> the one of NIST and the one of Innsbruck, in which they showed the teleportation of the state of an atom in a three-ion chain. Actually, things have evolved quite a lot since 2003. One can entangle several ions inside of an ion crystal, and this look really like a very prominent system for realizing quantum uh, information processing or also other type of quantum-based technologies with ions like quantum simulators uh, and quantum metrology. I would like also to mention that uh, there are also several discussions for using uh, uh, this ion crystal as a simulator of uh, astrophysical systems. This was actually one of the initial motivation for uh, realizing these experiments in the 80s. And there, uh, there was uh, invested uh, most of the work in studying the transition from liquid uh, to crystal. And also there are several uh, groups that focus on looking at ultra-cold uh, chemistry with this ion crystal, so that to observe uh, chemical reaction in a controlled way. So now we'll focus on the system, on the system within the system that I'm going to, be, I'm going to investigate. And what you see here, is actually a quadruple trap that is, was used uh, in 92 uh, in order to uh, study the several structures one can obtain when one starts from a highly anisotropic trap, uh, trap so that you can find practically the ions along the chain in a way so that you see them ordered along a string. So these red points are magnesium ions and their interparticle distances of the order of several micrometers so that you can practically assume that their interaction in this high vacuum environment is their Coulomb interaction, which is repulsive. So what did uh, Walter and co-workers do? They started to open the trap along the transverse direction. They had to take a very anisotropic trap so in order to force these ions to go along the line. They started to open the trap and the first thing they observed was the transition to a planar structure in which there were two strings and these two strings had the ions that if you draw a line, looks like a zigzag. And they went on, and then they saw that there was a transition to a delicolite structure, and so on, and so on, and, and they practically systematized the parameter regime in which these different structures are observed. There were some discussion at that time about what is the, the transition from linear to zigzag, and I'm going to enter in this, uh, uh, in this point. Actually, uh, we settled down uh, this, and uh, the problems that we... <laughs> Uh, we analyze the problem and show that this is a second order phase transition and this is what I'm going to discuss. I will also show that it is possible to see quantum effect at this second order phase transition from linear to zigzag and these quantum effects are indeed tunneling of the ion from one side to the other side of the chain that will give rise to a disordered type of system and you will see that this is actually a, some sort of natural quantum simulator of a ferromagnetic system. And then I will discuss how you can make, uh, you can start from this point and how you can make uh, quantum optics to the si of the system, for example, creating superposition between a zigzag structure of this sort and the other one in which this ion is on the other side, so practically the ordering is reversed, like in a mirror, and uh, discuss also how strong coupling with the electromagnetic <coughs> field may modify this behavior. So after this NIC preview, now you see the outline. 
I will talk about the linear ticks and transition. I don't think I will talk about quenches across the instability, uh, so that, which means to look at time-dependent changes of the frequency, but I will just give you a statement related to this part. I will discuss the quantum effect of the linear ticks and transition, and then uh, if I have time, uh, we'll give you a flavor of how to make a superposition of different crystalline structures across the phase transition, and what, how the behavior change is modified when you put these chains inside of cavities, what is actually done uh, in a very recent experiment, and what are the structural properties one observes. So, now I put always this slide because when I say the ion chain and I say I wanted to study the ion chain, people say, wow. The ion chain is a thing of te is a textbook example. You find it uh, in several textbooks, and indeed you do. You go to the Ashcroft Mermin, you look at the theory of the harmonic crystal, and then you go at the very end uh, of this chapter. And at the very end of this chapter, there is an exercise. And the exercise is, okay, now we did everything with nearest neighbors interaction. We have, however, the block theorem applying in the system. You have a periodic structure, so you can see that you can always solve the dispersion relation. Take that your uh, uh, interaction scales as 1 over r to the alpha and solve the dispersion relation. So you do it. You do it for any type of interaction. You take the Coulomb interaction. You find also an analytic solution for all the modes. Uh, and you see that, uh, fine, you know everything analytically. The only thing is that uh, if you study the behavior along wavelengths, you see that uh, differing to other type of interaction, which are not 1 over r, but 1 over r, uh, 1 plus alpha, then you see that uh, there is no sound velocity. What does it mean? So you don't have uh, at a uh, very small uh, wave vector a linear relation between frequency and wave vector so that you can have a, a photon-like excitation propagating through the chain. This is a consequence of the fact that the long-range interaction, uh, the Coulomb long-range interaction, even in 1D, is indeed long-range. So it has uh, some uh, effects uh, that lead them to the universality class in which you cannot assume it is a short-range interaction. So now what I show you here is a picture of an experiment <laughs> that was done in Aorus. These are something like 80 ions along a chain. And now you look at uh, the plots and where you have red, it means you have uh, more emission, more fluorescence. And then you see that uh, if you take uh, a typical linear pole trap, then the density of the ions, so the number of ions is larger in the middle of the trap and it becomes more rarefied at the edges. And you see indeed that you have a non-homogeneous distribution and the block theorem of the exercise of the ashcroft mermin doesn't apply. And also you have a long-range interaction potential which leads to the fact that even if you would like to say, well, it's not really a block theorem but I can assume that locally I have some sort of uniformity and then I let uh, with perturbative treatment uh, vary uh, uh, my phononic wave so to find the expression relation, then it doesn't work because the, the perturbation theory doesn't convert. Now what uh, you see here, that practically you have to use another approach, what you see here and I want you to look at, this is the Hamiltonian, this is the kinetic energy, this is the uh, potential energy of the trap. You, here nu is the trap frequency along the axis where is the chain and nu t is the transverse frequency. And we assume here that nu t is much larger than nu, and you can quantify how much larger it is, and I'm going to discuss it. And then you see the Coulomb interaction. These are the three types of energy that are playing a role and that will practically determine all the dynamics I'm going to discuss if I don't say, if I don't comment uh, or uh, otherwise. So say you wanted to solve uh, the dynamics of an ion chain in the, re in the regime in which it, is, uh, it forms a crystal. The first thing you want to do is you want to see what is the crystalline structure. So you want to solve uh, the problem of the charge density at equilibrium, which is actually a problem of taking the forces, the of equilibrium of forces, the Coulomb repulsion, which should balance uh, with the harmonic force which tends to push the atom toward the center. <coughs> you can do it uh, for a very large number of atoms, like in this case, 8 is sufficiently large for uh, applying a continuum limit. You have to do it in a clever way because you are taking a continuum limit of a charged gas, singly charged gas in one dimension. This has been done by Daniel Dubin. And what I show here is the linear density as a function of the distance from the center of the trap. N is the number of atoms. L is the length of the chain, which is found by means of a variational method. 
and 1 minus x squared over l squared is practically the behavior as a function of the distance. And what you see here are molecular dynamic simulation which compare the position of the ion with respect to the prediction of this uh, formula. I give just uh, this plot uh, to show you that one can study uh, this uh, uh, modes uh, and uh, actually I want to focus on the transverse spectrum. Now N labels the eigenmodes and is not the wave vector or the quasi-momentum of the crystal and it is not the quasi-momentum of the crystal because you have an inhomogeneous distribution of charges. This is here the transverse trap frequency, this is here the axial frequency, trap frequency, I focus on this. N equal to zero means the bulk mode, it means that practically the chain is oscillating in this direction. And it is actually the largest frequency, it is the frequency of the trap, and it is the largest frequency, and you can understand it in terms of the fact that if you confine uh, a series of charges of the same uh, sign on a line, you will tend to decrease the energy if you start to change uh, their interparticle distance. So practically, the, la the smallest frequency of the transverse spectrum is a, as a short wavelength type of excitation, and it is a frequency where the ion practically have a type of zigzag excitation. They the neighboring ion are oscillating out of phase. So if you study this regime, you actually see that uh, the phononic type of excitation that you would take in a uniform crystal are actually valid. And if you just focus on this behavior, which is then the behavior which is relevant when you look at the linear zigzag instability, then you see that uh, the description of uh, the chain uh, of ions of Ashcroft can be applied, and this is what I will do. I just make two comments. If you look at the, st the statistical mechanical property of the chain, uh, you see that you can define a thermodynamic limit. You study just uh, the limit in which only the excel excitation are relevant, and see that the specific heat is the one of a Debye crystal. So you have the Dulong Petit Law for uh, large. Uh, temperature and you see that the specific heat goes to zero for small temperature but indeed if you look at the scaling with the number of particles you see that the specific heat is not independent on the number of particles but the scale is one over the square root of the logarithm of n. So you have a non-extensive behavior and the non-extensive behavior is due to the long range Coulomb interaction and it appears only in the quantum mechanical regime. In the classical regime is absent because you have the dual PT. So now we go close to the instability and I go close to the regime in which one sees uh, that the chain becomes a mechanical unstable and undergo to a zigzag structure. I take uh, the normal mode, uh, the ring of uh, Ashcroft, and I show you here what you obtain, the formula that you obtain when you look at the instability. Here you have uh, uh, the frequency of the trap. Now we take a ring, we take a periodic distribution. The quasi-momentum of the crystal is a good quantum number. So kappa is now the parameter that we take in order to label the modes. So we see that the transfer frequency is equal, to a, is equal to a difference between two quantities which are both positive. The trap frequency that you apply squared minus a term which depends on the interaction between the ions. And now this term may be equal or larger than the trap frequency and this will give you that you have an instability. So the critical value is exactly when the smallest frequency of this branch touches zero and it is found uh, making an equation here, putting this equal to zero for k corresponding to the shortest wavelength and gives you this value. So if you decrease uh, the transverse confinement, then you see that you first have a linear chain, you have here the uh, transverse branch. When you touch the zero, this happens at the zigzag <coughs> mode and then you have a uh, period doubling that gives you that the pre zone is halved, so you have four branches that mix the axial and the transverse mode, and uh, you see the zigzag uh, structure that is here sketched for this ring. So if you want to study this transition, this is actually going to be complex because you, can, you have to get rid of the harmonic theory and you have to get into, into the detail of the nonlinearity of the Coulomb interaction. On the other hand, you can, be, you can make some uh, uh, considerations that can lead you in studying uh, the anharmonic correction and uh, identifying what type of phase transition this is. So the first thing you observe that this is a, there is a symmetry breaking from a line to a plane. You can identify an order parameter, which is the distance of the ions from the axis. And the chain is zero, and then the zigzag start to be different from zero. 
There is a control field, which is a transverse frequency. It could be the density, but here we focus on the transverse frequency. And the soft mode, the one that drives the system in the new configuration, is the zigzag mode. If you do this, and let me mention that these are pictures done in Saarbrücken in the experiment of Jürgen Eschner. Actually, to observe a transition from a linear to a zigzag in an experiment is uh, pretty simple. And you can ask the experimentalist, can you do me, please, three pictures, one of, on the linear, one for the zigzag, and one for a larger zigzag? So making a long story short, you go into the detail, you take the potential of the Coulomb interaction not to second order, what you would do for the harmonic crystal, but you go up to fourth order. Then you see that the third order disappears. Following the educated, the educated guess, you see that actually you can uh, reduce the whole potential. So you analyze all terms and uh, take an answer and see that actually there is just one mode that becomes unstable very close to the instability. And this mode is actually the soft mode, the zigzag mode. All the other modes of the linear chain are stable. So what does it mean? That the new <coughs> equilibrium position are just determined by the amplitude of the soft mode. And the amplitude of the soft mode is governed by this effective potential, which has the form of a Mexican head. So what you see is, as a Mexican head when you are below the uh, critical value, what you see here is the quadratic part, and here that's the quartic part. The quadratic part has a term which becomes negative when the frequency is below the transverse frequency. From this, you see that practically the phase transition linear to zigzag is a uh, nice uh, example of a Landau type of phase transition with all the critical exponents that are then predicted by that mean field theory. I'm going to skip this, but if you practically use the uh, dynamical effect of the phase transition, you have a very nice theory that connects uh, um, a dynamical effect and equilibrium effect, which is a keyboard theorem mechanism, and we tested it in this system. I go to the quantum effects, and I go back to the picture that I gave before. We have the quantum phase transition, now, so we take into account kinetic energy. So far, I was just talking about the potential. So say we identify this frequency where we have uh, the instability according to our potential. We look for the equilibrium position. Then we check whether they were stable. And we see they are no more stable when the transverse trap frequency goes below to this value. OK, so in principle, you expect a zigzag. But your potential is now a double well potential. And kinetic energy will give you tunneling. So now we take this effect and we study the phase transition. I will be faster, just uh, say that in this work, uh, uh, effect have been studied for three ions. We now take it in the thermodynamic limit. limit. So what one sees is that uh, uh, for this uh, linear zigzag instability, the Coulomb interaction is effectively, but only for this case, is effectively like a short range interaction, so it can be mapped by uh, adjusting the parameter in an appropriate way to a nearest neighbor type of model. <coughs> so you have an effective potential, which is a quartic potential, like the one, uh, like the double well in two dimension that I was showing before, that compete uh, locally, that compete with the interaction. The type of phase transition you can imagine in this way, you have a series of uh, potential, which are local for the ions. And the tendency for the ion is that uh, they will be in the minimum, and, and when uh, the potential becomes a double well, they will be either on the left or on the right side, and they will tunnel between the two. And the interaction will tend to order the ions so that they increase the distance. So the quantum phase transition arises from the competition between tunneling and the interaction by using uh, path integral uh, type of treatment, which are pretty standard for this uh, type of problem. We take the gradient action, we study um, we integrate out uh, the fluctuations, uh, identifying some sort of dipole, so the ion can be left or right, and so it is like a spin. And so we get out uh, an effective Hamiltonian, which is an easy model in the transverse field, in which all the parameters are, can be mapped to the uh, uh, <coughs> physical parameter of the problem and allow us practically to see where you can be in your experiment if you want to study this quantum effect. From this, uh, we can extract a phase diagram and what I want to point out in the phase diagram is that, say, this is a line at t equal to 0. This is the difference of the transverse frequency with respect to the critical one predicted by the classical theory. So at 0, you would have the transition from linear to zigzag. Quantum effect shift the critical point. You have a disorder phase here. And the zigzag is found <coughs> at a shifted value. There are, uh, we check the parameter uh, and uh, saw that uh, practically 
uh, there are demanding conditions, but uh, these are achievable by means of uh, sideband cooling the ion chain to sufficiently low temperature, which have to be of the order of uh, uh, 10 microkelvin. Sorry, is it? Yes, 10 microkelvin. And uh, uh, the transition can be measured, so the quantum effect of transition can be measured by the structural form factor. By means of this, you can extract the critical exponent. And in particular, you have two components on the structural form factor. Here it is reported on the side of the zigzag. So you have the break peaks of the zigzag that have a height which scales uh, like the distance from the critical point to the two beta. So this peak increases the farther away you are from the critical point. And you have a background signal coming from tunneling that decreases the farther away you go from the critical point from gamma and beta. Actually, gamma and beta are critical exponent of the easing model in the transverse field, and they are different from the critical exponent predicted by the Landau model. I go to the quantum optics now part, and I say, good, now we understand this problem, and we want now to play with it. We want to engineer the system. And the first thing we want to do is to say, okay, these ions now, they have an internal structure. If you have an internal structure, you can also use dipole forces by means of a, you drive an optical transition, and you can use dipole forces by means of a standing wave, by means of a focused laser beam, in order to make spin-dependent forces. So say that I want to create a potential that is such that if the ions are in the ground state, they are in the linear, and if the ions are in the excited state, they are in a zigzag. Now I create a superposition between the ground and excited state. Do I create a superposition between a linear and a zigzag? Actually, to create a state which is a superposition of all ion in the ground state and all ion in the excited state is pretty difficult. It's a challenging problem. But you can do it with one. You will create a quench, a localized quench. And if the chain is sufficiently small so that the correlation length uh, of the model is larger than the size of the crystal, you will practically, by exciting one ion feeling such a force, create a zigzag configuration for all the ions. Okay? This is the idea. So what you see here is the potential which is state dependent. We have two different potential. If we are, all the ions are in the ground state, they are in the zigzag. If we excite the central ion in the excited state, it is in the linear. Now, what you will have is that internal and external degrees of freedom will be entangled by the dynamics. Since the Hamiltonian for the crystal will be different depending on the internal state. So we made an analysis, at a type of stability analysis, you know, how you have to change these potentials in order to create such a superposition. This is what this slide should what's say. Of, what's phi of t? Phi of t, phi of t is the evolved uh, state that you get when you excite. So you now excite the central ion, it becomes uh, an excited state. Now the, uh, it will be the initial state, it will be the one corresponding to the ground state of the zigzag but it is not stable because the Hamiltonian is now different. So the Hamiltonian is now the Hamiltonian of uh, corresponding to the one in which you would have the excitation of a linear chain. And so phi of t is the evolved state according to the Hamiltonian where you would have the linear chain. And so you get that uh, internal and external degrees of freedom becomes now entangled because of the dynamics. Thank you for uh, telling this. I have three minutes, and this is a generous offer. Thank you. <laughs> this, uh, so I was uh, going to say very fast that uh, what we do is practically to make a citation. So to here, uh, say, we take a certain aspect ratio, and delta alpha means that uh, this is the force that we apply, which is a spin-dependent force, which apply in the excited state. Mm -hmm. So say, if we excite the ion from a point here to a point here, we can... Uh, have a structure which is a zigzag when all the ions are in the ground state, and a structure which is a linear when all the ions are in the excited state. So say that you make a Ramsey interferometry, you invert then the pulse after a certain time. And this is the elapsed time between the first pulse, creating the superposition, and the second pulse, inverting the process. So what you're going to see in this process is a series of peaks which periodically appear and this periodicity is indeed uh, determined by the soft mode. Here you see the visibility signal at three different regimes, uh, the one in which you excite uh, uh, the uh, two states so that the excited state sees a uh, um, uh, steeper zigzag. Here you do it across the, across the phase transition. Here they are two linear. 
And this is exactly the region, the one in the middle, in which the chain is excited across the, um, the phase transition. And what, what you see here, these lines, they practically determine where is the um, time of the revival according to the point in which you are along this line. So the time of the revival diverges. It diverges actually at this point. And this point corresponds indeed uh, to the instability. And you can actually associate, uh, if you look at the Fourier transform of this signal, three lines. Uh, one line corresponding to the, uh, that give the important frequency. One frequency is the frequency of the soft mode, which becomes unstable and then uh, becomes another mode across the instability. And then you see here several frequency that indicate that you have some entanglement. I say three words uh, to what happens if you put the ions inside of a cavity. Now we take a setup like this one. In addition to the mechanical energy of the ions, what you have now is also the AC star shift of the cavity potential, which d depends on where the ions are. This dependence gives rise to the nonlinearity because the photons are multiply scattered by the ions, and this multiple scattering gives rise to a long range type of interaction, which is even more long range than the Coulomb. And this long range type of interaction modifies the stability property. This modification gives rise to hysteresis. So, what you see here is intensity at the cavity output, where you can associate uh, to this as a function of a pump on the cavity, where you can associate to this line the linear chain, to this line the zigzag, and so you find the regime in which both are stable. And if you look, for example, at uh, the behavior at one point here around, and you look at the spectrum of the excitation, the spectrum mixes photonic and vibrational excitations so that if you look at it for increasing cooperativity, so for increasing coupling strength with the cavity mode, then the lines of the zigzag, the one that you would associate to each mode, actually broaden and give rise to funnel like resonances. And this is at this funnel like resonances, one observes entanglement between photonic and vibrational degrees of freedom. Now, I give a very short outlook. I show that structural transition and ion crystal are natural quantum simulators of solid state system. Quantum effects are like tunneling at the instability can be observed. If you quench across the phase transition, you can access uh, motional, decrease of, um, motional excitation like Schrodinger cut state with internal control by the internal state. And uh, one point that we are asking ourselves is whether we can make some quantum reservoir engineering so that you can cool the chain by means of a dissipative process into an entangled state. And uh, I don't say you, I don't tell you anything, but I was going to tell you that it is possible. And, uh, uh, we find a way of, uh, by means of taking two defects uh, inside of the chain to create uh, entanglement, a steady state. I just uh, wanted to thank the collaborators of this work, Shmuel Fishman and Efrat Shimshoni, who played a very relevant role in the first stages and in several stages of the work I presented. Simone Montangero and Tommaso Calarco. Tommaso was involved in several of the work I I mentioned, and Simone is now working on a density matrix normalization group type of uh, simulation for uh, studying quenches across the phase transition. Alex Retzker, Adolfo Del Campo, and Martin Pirini were involved in the quenching across the phase transition. Grigori Astracarcio and Jordi Boronada didn't mention the work we did together. Thomas Fogarty and Thomas Bush, who are involved in the work I just uh, said in three <coughs> lines, and this is the group at the Universidad de Sarlandes, and I want to mention in particular Cecilia Kormik, who is an Alexander von Humboldt Fellow, and Jens Baltrush, who were uh, uh, the student and the postdoc uh, involved in the latest two work I mentioned. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>